Terry Met, virtual traveller, and welcome back to Stories from Law, a monthly podcast that explores folklore and the stories it inspires. My name is Dawn Nelson, and I am an author and professional storyteller. Today, I'm looking at the folklore that can be found in the Norse myths, and the story from law for this episode is the Norse creation story. The most comprehensive collection of Norse mythology is considered to be found in the work of Snorri Stolson, and it is called the Prose Eda. It is a set of poems describing the Norse gods and goddesses, worlds and stories, kennings and skaldic poetry. It was written in Iceland in the early 13th century and starts with the story of Gnungagap and ends with the war to end all wars, Ragnarok. You may see this set of myths called the Asatru, as this is the name of the religion dedicated to the Norse pantheon and was followed from Austria to Iceland and beyond. In Snorri Stolson's record, the Eda, referred to in the title, is Old Norse for Great Grandmother, and it is a nod to the fact that these stories have been passed down through generations. So what does the Eda tell us? It tells us of the Azir, the principal gods of Asgard, whom you may have heard of. These are Odin, Frigg, Thor, Balder and Tyu. They all dwell in Asgard. And then there is the Vanir. The Vanir dwell in Vanaheim, and they too are gods and goddesses, but they prefer to concentrate their efforts on health, wisdom, fertility and nature, unlike the gods of Asgard, who are more predisposed to war. The Vanir do fight, and in fact they have to fight the gods of Asgard when the Nine Worlds are still in their infancy, and there is such destruction that eventually the gods draw up a peace treaty where Freya, a Vanir goddess, is sent to live in Asgard, and Mimir, the god of knowledge and wisdom, is sent to live with the Vanir. Mimir famously loses his head when the Vanir accuse him of spying for the Azir. But that's a story for another day. I want to go right back to the beginning to look at the creation of these nine worlds and how much of the mythology in these stories still presents itself in our folklore today. There are other beings within the nine worlds that are created, and you may recognise some of these too. There are dwarves, elves, giants, an enormous lindworm-type creature named Jorgmunda, also known as the Midgard Serpent. And there is also Fenrir, an enormous slathering wolf-like black dog, perhaps a little like the black dogs in our first episode. In fact, the wild hunt mentioned in the first episode is thought to relate to the Norse mythology. Asgard, Vanaheim, Elfheim, Midgard, Jotunheim, Helheim, Niflheim, Muspelheim and Nidavellir are the nine worlds that make up the Norse mythology. And different races live in these different realms. The warring gods in Asgard, the nature gods in Vanaheim, the elves in Alfheim, the humans in Midgard, the giants in Jotunheim, the dead with the goddess Hel in Helheim, and the dwarves in Nidavellir. Niflheim and Muspelheim are the lands of ice and fire, respectively. At the top of these worlds, joining them together with its roots, is the world tree, Idrasil. The tree was created from a golden seed, and this tree is an ash tree. I will tell you a little more about Idrisil in the story that accompanies this episode, but the sacred nature of ash trees has worked its way into our folklore and is significant not only in Scandinavian folklore, but also in the folklore of the British Isles. In Scottish law, the ash is a magical tree whose roots extend deep underground and therefore symbolises stability. It is recorded that those who dared to cut down an ash tree were then banished from their parish. To cut even just one branch of the tree was considered a serious crime. However, if the tree's permission was sought first, and the wood gathered with humility and respect, then the tree could become a valuable friend. Perhaps a lesson in sustainability, and only taking what you need. Ash was once used to support the king's thigh, as it was used to make a throne upon which he sits. However, the ash wasn't always such good news for royalty. If the ash tree failed to produce seeds one year, then this foretold of a death within the royal family within a year. In England, in 1648, this did happen. No ash trees 
produced seeds. Or so it was said. And then, a year later in 1649, Charles I was executed for high treason and the monarchy was briefly abolished in England. So, maybe there was some truth in it. Who knows? In Ireland, the ash is part of a trilogy of sacred trees, oak, ash and hawthorn. In fact, there are five magic trees in Ireland, and three of these trees were cut down around 665 by Christians in order to symbolise their victory over paganism. On Creevna Island stood the sacred ash tree, and it is said that there are still descendants of this tree living today. In the 19th century, twigs from the descendant of the Creevna tree were carried by emigrants to the United States as a means of protection against drowning on the long journey to their new home. In Yorkshire, carters hung ash keys from their horses' bridles in order to protect them on their journeys. The ash tree was thought to cure ills as well. Warts and birth defects are among many of them. In fact, if there was a cleft in an ash tree, an unwell child would be passed through this cleft and the cleft sealed up with clay and mud. As the tree healed, so did the child. Perhaps this is another nod to the source of life the ash is often associated with. Finally, in the darkest days of December, at Yuletide, the ash is a favoured choice for the Yule log. And in fact, for many, ash is a good firewood. The Yule log is a half-burnt log from last year's fire that is kept and used to light this year's. Again, symbolic of that cycle of life. So, now you know how important the ash still is today, let us hear about where it all began, long ago for the gods of the Norselands. In the beginning, there was darkness. Cold, black, sooty darkness. Not sooty like the ash that you find in the fire, you understand. No, this was the beginning, not an end. It was dark like the womb, unknown like the day of a man who cannot yet see, and empty like a forest not yet grown. Seeping into this darkness from the south, from a place called Muspel, there came fire bringing warmth. And from the north, in the land called Niflheim, there came ice to temper the destruction of fire. In the middle, there lies Geninga Gap, the yawning gap, the moor of creation, a mighty chasm. From Niflheim, through the swirling mists and clawing cold, there springs a well. This is Hvelgamir, and from that well flows eleven rivers. Relentlessly they travel towards the centre, across the ice and the fire, bringing with them cinder, slag and slush to fill Ganunga Gap and create Elevagar, the river within the gap. And where the ice and the fire mix with this water, well, it mixes to fill the nooks and crannies of that giant gap. In this slaggy, claggy, soupy mess that lies in Ganunga Gap, up to the top of it, there comes a golden seed. This golden seed grows into a tree. This is the ash tree, Idrisil, the world tree. And from this tree, all plants have their origins. This mighty plant's roots sit in three wells. Within its mighty arborous arms sits an eagle who holds a knowledge of all things. And at the base of the tree is the dragon Nidhogg that nibbles at the roots. Between the two runs Ratatosk the squirrel, conveying messages from one to another. Meanwhile, back in Ganunga Gap, life is still forming. From the slaggy claggy mess there is still more life to come, and that is the Jotun, Ymir, a gigantic man, fetid and sweating, alone in his being. He is the first of the giants. From the sweat that forms on his skin as he sleeps, his children are born, Mimir and Bessler, 
and they in turn birth generations of Jotuns, a nation of giants. Further up Gununga Gap, there is more life in the form of a mighty oryx, or dumbler, an enormous cow, and from her come four rivers of milk that sustain the Jotun and their children. This is an onerous task for a dumbler, and so she starts to look within the ice to quench her thirst and give her the nutrients that she needs for this task. She licks and licks and licks and licks. And on the first day, golden hair appears from the ice. She licks, and she licks, and she licks, and she licks, and on the second day, a man's head emerges from the ice. She licks, licks, and licks, and then on the third day, a man pulls himself from the ice and drinks the milk of Ordumla. This man is Buri. He is beautiful. He is a god. His son will be Bor. Bor marries Bestler, and they in turn have three children. You may have heard of these children. They are Odin, Vili, and Ve. And from the first day that they lay eyes on the Jotun, they are against them, and these brothers will fight them. As they grow older, they fight more wars with them. Once they are grown, and after many battles, the three brothers are eventually the death of Ymir the first fetid, steaming giant. Ymir's blood runs thick and fast, and his kind are drowned, unable to hold back its tide. What few are actually able to survive are pushed back into the land that we now know as Jotunheim. The brothers look around at the destruction that they have created, and sensing that there is a time to create a new world, they begin to fashion what we now know as Midgard, this will become Earth, our world, the human world. From Ymir's skull, they create a sky by placing the four corners at the four corners of the Earth. This covers Ganinga Gap. Ymir's brains become the clouds and they throw them up into the sky and who knows what thoughts they may now hold. Finally, the last glowing embers of Muspel are used to create the sun, the moon and the stars. From the roots of the great ash Idrisil comes Ask, the first man. And as Odin, Vili and Ve go off on their adventures, they find the elm tree. And from that, they take a branch and make the first woman, Embla. Vili puts blood into their veins. Ve gives them thoughts in their head. And Odin, the Allfather, breathes life into their lungs. Next, the brothers turn to Jotunheim once more, and from the giants that are left, they take the mother and son night and day. The three brother gods have one last task to allocate, and so from Midgard they take two humans. These are Sol and Marni. Marni will carry the moon, and Sol will carry the sun and both will ride in horse-drawn carriages. Still, they travel across our skies, each chased by a solitary wolf. These wolves are Skull and Haiti. They snap at their heels until the day to end all days arrives, and every now and then, they almost catch them. And this is what we know as an eclipse. But it is only when the days of Ragnarok arrive that the wolves will finally catch and swallow the sun and the moon, and darkness will fall on the nine worlds. But until Ragnarok arrives, and until that day comes, Odin and his children to come will have many more adventures across the nine realms. But those stories, my friend, those are stories for another day. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Unfortunately, there is a huge threat facing the ash tree in this country right now, and that is ash dieback, which has finally reached us. It's predicted to kill up to 95% of our ash trees, and it's a travesty. But in the main, it's something that's very hard to do something about. However, the Woodland Trust has suggested some things that you can do to try and slow the spread of the fungal spores on the ash trees. 
These are to wash your shoes, bike wheels and pram wheels if you have been walking or riding through woodland. Also to avoid taking cuttings from the ash tree, the keys or the seeds. In this way, we can perhaps try and help the ash survive this travesty. You can find an extended version of this episode featuring a look at the folklore associated with the god Thor and the story from lore Thor's journey to Utgard across on my Patreon, Rewild Yourself Through Story. You can also find digital zines and audio stories. And you can find my Patreon by going to www.patreon.com forward slash DD Storyteller. I do hope to see you there as I'd love to tell you another story. A big thank you to all my patrons, without whom this podcast would not be possible. There are other ways that you can support the podcast. And these are leaving a review. These help the stories journey out into the world and to reach new audiences. And telling your friends and sharing the podcast with them. You may notice that season one's shows are being released weekly. And that's because these shows were originally aired as live stream shows earlier this year and I've now converted them to audio for the purposes of the podcast. Season 2 will be launched in the new year, and the episodes will then be released monthly. For more stories woven with folklore in the old ways, you can also find me on Facebook as DD Storyteller, and on Instagram as at DD underscore Storyteller. I also have a Facebook group called Stories from Law, and there we share folklore and music and books and chat a little about the podcast. Thank you for listening. And I'll see you again soon for more stories from Law. Toodle pip! <laughs>